The sermon text today is the appointed Old Testament lesson, uh, 2 Samuel, the seventh chapter. Now when the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king, David, said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent in the tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. I'm a kind of a church groupie. I, I admit that. And by church here, I mean specifically church buildings. When I'm in D.C., I have to go to the Washington Cathedral. When I'm in New York City, it's St. Paul's. In San Francisco, it's St. Gregory's or Grace Cathedral on Knob Hill. When I've gone to Ireland, I can't pass up a crumbling medieval monastery chapel in the middle of a cow pasture or the roofless, roofless remains of an ancient church now in the parking lot of a city distillery. Whether they've been empty for 500 years or whether they are filled with the pure sounds of a boy's choir and all the smells and bells of high church liturgy, they create in me a sense of awe and gravity. So, today's reading from 2 Samuel is a helpful jab in the ribs for me. It's a blunt corrective to people like me who sometimes equate old stone with the exclusive presence of God. This wonderful exchange between the young King David, the prophet Nathan, and the God of Israel begins with David ruminating on his next moves as he sits in his new palace in Jerusalem, his new capital city in the southern hills of Palestine. Call it Davidsburg. David has now conquered the Philistines. He has consolidated the northern and southern kingdoms into one united Israel. And he has located the lost Ark of the Covenant and brought it to Jerusalem and placed it in a tent. For a time, all is at rest. So David looks out the window of his cedar mansion where moth does not corrupt nor thieves break in and steal. And he spies the tent of the Ark, the very seat of God. He calls in the house chaplain, Nathan, and he says to Nathan, I have an idea. I'm sitting here in this fine palace in the lap of luxury, 
And the God of Israel, to whom I owe all of this, is over there in a tent for wandering nomads. I need to do something about that. And Nathan says, fine, go for it. Now, we don't really know whether David's plan is inspired by his devotion to the God who has been with him from his poetry days to his warrior days, or because he figures an impressive temple in the middle of town would help him consolidate political and religious power in Jerusalem. Doesn't matter. That night, God comes to Nathan and says, not so fast. You neglected to check in with me. Go and find David and tell him this and tell him straight from me, so you want to build me a house? I have not lived in a house since I led the people out of Egypt. I've been moving with my people in a tent ever since. I've been among them wherever they went. Did I once complain? No. I was happy to do it. You're not going to build a house for me. I'm going to build one for you. From you will come offspring whose kingdom I shall establish. I'll build him his throne, and he can build me a house for my name. Now this is part slap down and part promise. It's a little reminiscent of Yahweh appearing to a demanding Job, which we read a few weeks ago, where God says, you really think you know what's up? You think you know me? Where were you when I created the boundaries of the thundering ocean and set the stars in the heavens? You think you're pretty smart. Tell me. Well, here, God tells David, so you want to build me a house. You want to plant me right next to you. Keep an eye on me. Trot me out when it suits you. That's not going to happen. In fact, and here's the promise, delivered almost defiantly. I'm going to build you a house. From your offspring will come a dynasty that I will never abandon. And him, I'll let build me a house. Well, if you thought that going into this story from 2 Samuel was a story about David, as much of the book is, it's not. God is the subject here. God is the actor. And God is clear that David, however beloved by God, is not going to control God's comings and goings by putting him in a stone and cedar temple. God wants to keep moving. Go where God wants. God is Lord and God is a free spirit. God will not be domesticated. Some years ago, some many years ago now, I lived for a few years after college in a little apartment off Polo Road near the Wake Forest campus. And I don't remember if it was then or a few years later that First Assembly of God built that huge church building that erupted essentially in the backyard of that little apartment. We called it the God Box. Now I suppose that's a little irreverent, but it described this house of God that was this huge monolith that cast a large shadow literally on those little polo road houses. Now I'm sure that First Assembly folks would agree that the God Box, even if they may have cringed to hear it called that, was constructed like so many churches in town to the glory of God and as places for the people of God to gather for praise and training for ministry in the world. As big and impressive as that sanctuary is, no one had the illusion that the God box was a box to put God in. We all know that when we build a church, it is not the exclusive home of God. And yet we might still benefit from that occasional reminder. We cannot put God in a box. We are able to create these glorious edifices but we can't put God in them and close the door. In one sense, we should not even call this space the house of God. This is not God's home. We might better call it the house of the people of God. 
As a Lutheran, I'm tr still trying to remember, for example, that this is a table and not an altar. A table around which the people of God gather, not an altar on which to lay a sacrifice before the God who lives there. Unlike Catholic and some Anglican and, and a few Lutheran churches, you do not reserve the communion wafers between communion services in what's called a tabernacle, representing the presence of God there at all times. God is among us here, but God is not uniquely here in this place that we built to worship him. <coughs> the sanctuary beautiful as it is, with a long and wonderful history, is not God's house. At least it is not where God lives. God is a free spirit. We do not control God. God goes where God desires. And God desires to be wherever are the people whom God has made and loves. Do you hear the promise and the challenge there, all rolled up into one. Yahweh, through Nathan, or this time through Cole Porter, says, don't fence me in. I've been roaming like a nomad with my people for hundreds of years. I'm not ready to settle down. I am a free spirit. You cannot control the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the promise of good digs. That's the challenge. And it's a challenge to David's desire to domesticate God. And it's a challenge to our tendency to think that we've turned God into something we can control. We can't keep God in the good neighborhoods. God can't be kept in the camp of a political party or denomination. God is not my God. God remains the God who travels on his own terms wherever God wills. God is a free spirit. <coughs> but there's a promise here, too. First, if God is on the move and free to do so, then we will not likely get ahead of God. We will not go into places where God is not present. God is present here, but God is always on the move, not contained by these walls. So when we leave this house of God's people, we don't go into a godless territory. We don't leave God behind. We go to where God already is. In struggling families, in homeless shelters on the city streets, in conference rooms, corporate boards, and at the coffee pot where people are lonely, hungering for something or someone to hold on to. Someone who can help or at least stand by with an open heart and a steady hand. Not only is God already there, but in promising David a house, God promised to establish the people of God forever. God would never abandon his people. He would admonish them, but never abandon them. God would make them instruments of God for the sake of the redeeming and the healing of the world. Now, if that's on too grandiose a scale for you, let's make it a little more personal. We baptized Lillian Vance today. And in doing so, we didn't make God do anything. We acknowledged that God has freely chosen Lillian to be one of his own. From the promise of David's house to the promise to Lillian's house, God has promised once through the words of the prophet Nathan, and now in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, never to abandon the people of his redeeming. And in the words of today's baptismal liturgy, you can almost hear Yahweh repeat what he told David. Before you do anything for me, I will do something for you. I will make you mine. But today those words are especially for Lillian and as well for all of you who hear those words again spoken uh, so many times since your own baptisms. If Lillian and the rest of us can start with that promise, we will not be tempted to keep God in a house 
to domesticate God into something that we can control because the free and almighty and unpredictable God is in the end already with us and already for us. People who believe that can become people of courage. They find themselves free, free to follow a God who himself is free to move among the people of his creating. And so often he moves to where there are broken spirits and hungry stomachs and grieving hearts and heavy shoulders. So let's celebrate that God has chosen to be among us here in word and sacrament. And let's take on the challenge to follow a God who moves out into a needy world. Amen. Thank you.